When you believe you're financially independent and you do not need the business, your conversations get a lot easier. Mm -hmm. Salespeople are under such pressure, either themselves, if they have quotas, leadership coming down, looking at those numbers, that this pressure starts to apply and we get desperate. Mm -hmm. See, when you're financially independent, you don't need to have the business, but you'd love to have it if it makes sense for both parties. Yeah. So that's what I go in. I want to learn about people. What's your situation? What are you hoping to avoid, accomplish, alleviate? How might I be able to help you? Let's let's talk about that. And at the end of the day, if it's not a mutual fit, I don't try to force it because there's more people out there and I'm okay. Hey, Jack Lair here down Lair's Lair. Lair Podcast. So I have this amazing guest with me. She is an incredible sales trainer, and she's way more than that. So I'm going to welcome Kate Kohler to the Lair. Thank you, Jack, for having me today. Wonderful. So let's bring a lot of energy. And Kate is one of the best sales trainers that I've ever been associated with. That's kind. Yeah. (laughs) That's kind of you to say. That's kind. Um, (laughs) But there's a history to the relationship, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of history. Your pops. My dad. Yes, my father. Yeah. I get emotional when I talk about Ed. Oh, me too. He's a great person. He changes lives. He, he did. changes lives. He, he changed my life. He, and, um, you know, he was the one responsible for us getting together. Yeah. 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 He, yeah. And, and that happened naturally with a lot of our customers. I'm working with second, third generations. I'm working with second and third generations of, of people who dad started that process with. Yeah. And here we are all these years later. So it, it led me to you. It's so cool because um, Ed shares the story about how he took a risk in his life with, with the permission of his wife, right? Yeah. yeah. Tibby, my mother. Yeah. yeah. To, uh, to leave a, um, a nice paying job, right? Mm-hmm. And go in this. Well, he was in the trucking industry. He was in the trucking industry, which my husband has been in the trucking industry for 20 years. So that's a little crazy. But he was heir apparent to be president of that company. Yeah. And it was when trucking got deregulated. And he had been implementing sales training programs across the country with drivers, customer service reps, their salespeople. And it, they started to pull back when that was the last thing during that recession and deregulation. He, yeah. he had found a passion in training. So it led him to Sandler and he could continue on that training passion versus being the president of a trucking company. It wasn't as much jazz for him. It didn't impact as many lives. But it was a big risk because he was he was being paid at a pretty nice level. Company car, benefits, all that went to scratch zero overnight. So that's why my mother had to be on board for that. Yeah. Yeah. Goodness. Um, Damn it. I'm getting emotional just talking about (laughs) that because. Oh, (laughs) Yeah, the stuff that he did for me and, yeah. and the people in my world, it, it, it was life-changing, really. Yeah. Yeah. And that right there is why I went into this business. Walk in, I was working in the restaurant industry seven days a week, and then I started working for Dad part-time behind the scenes, doing some admin work. And him and I were taking a walk one afternoon after he was done training, and I looked at Dad and I said, Dad... I can do what you do. I can be a trainer and a coach. And he, he kind of tapped me on the head and he's like, well, first you got to prove you can sell. If you're going to teach sales training, you, yeah. you have to be able to sell. And I said, I want to impact lives. I see you're changing people yeah. and what you do for them, not just professionally, not helping them just make more money, but inside out change with their families, their friendships, their relationships. It It's more than just sales training, what we do. Yeah. So. I was exposed to Sandler sales training prior to meeting Ed from a company right. out of That's Philadelphia, right. yep. uh, from a company that I was um, uh, representing at the time, and they introduced me to Sandler, and I was like, "Wow, this is pretty intriguing because it's a tradition. It's 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 a one hundred and eighty from traditional selling. Sure it is. Um, and it is is a system that you follow, and we'll we'll get into that here in a little bit. But yeah, it it led me to find a trainer locally because I didn't want to be driving to Philly sure. two hours once a week or twice a week yeah. or whatever and I, I i found ed yeah your dad yeah and like this connection was just really mm. <laughs> <laughs> ed <damn> you. <laughs> and your and your incredible daughter like it just really yeah I, I know what it did for me and i know what it has done for others that i've exposed sandler to and how it made a difference in their life and it's so interesting to see when you understand and you start implementing this process and like you're around your children. The next thing you know, like your mm-hmm. seven-year-old son goes, dad, 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 um, 
did I catch it a bad time? Yeah. And you're like, oh my gosh. It works. It does. <laughs> it, when you live it. When you live it. And that's one of our biggest messages. Sales training, you don't just go into the sales training room and then apply it in your professional life because that's not what we teach. We, we teach attitude, behavior, technique, and those should be espoused in all of your roles of life because that's what determines your success in your roles, right? Yeah. So you can use it at sales and, and you know turn that off and go home and violate the very things that you know work in the professional world. You should be using it with the people that matter most first and then you get it right in the professional world. Most definitely. So we're all not going to learn Sandler today. We're going to learn some techniques, what's about the systems and the process yeah. and some stuff that can really help you maybe move the needle a little bit mm -hmm. in your world. But truly, you know, you what's that saying that Sandler talked about, um, about going to a, um, uh, like learning the, learning it, you can't learn. You can't to teach ride. a kid to ride a bike at a seminar. There you go. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah. you can go there and you can get fired up and get excited, but it's ongoing, continuous training. Yes, sales mastery. And that's the key. Most people who are really um, serious about selling and they want to be the best, they understand that you don't just go and for a couple hours, think that's gonna be the magic sauce, right? Yeah. They understand this is long-term, gradual, incremental growth where they're adding things to their toolkit every single time they're in the room. Yeah. This morning, I've already had a couple training sessions since 7 a.m. and these are successful people that I'm working with in the HVAC industry. Uh -huh. Their top salesperson, every time he unmutes when we do our virtual training, he said, man, I used to do this I got out of the habit and it was so powerful. Yeah. I got to get back to owning that. So even the top salespeople keep coming back for that reinforcement, like going to the health club for yeah. your, your muscles so they That's don't right. atrophy. You got to get to the sales club. Yeah. You got to work that, work the lid. Absolutely. Work the brain. Um, and when you truly have a sales process that you're following, yeah, it's, it's a great way to have, um, it's an accountability to it, right? Absolutely. It's your roadmap. If I screwed up, let's look in the mirror first. A lot of salespeople, they'll, they'll get mad at the wrong end of the problem. The, oh, that prospect didn't do this. They didn't get back to me. They're, they're ghosting me. Well, what did, you do, what did you do to get that commitment for when are we going to connect? Yeah. What happens if we don't? And I've taught people to look at themselves first. Where could have I followed the process more stringently? What did I, what did I neglect to cover? What did I neglect to ask? Oh, crap next time I'm going to get this. So it's that it's that roadmap for if you get off track, you know where to get back on. Most definitely. And, and you can go back and deal with issues that you didn't deal with by going back into the compartment. Like so Sandler uses this the submarine and starts out with a um, um, bonding and report. Bonding report. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And that is what is so key. The very beginning of our sales process is if you don't have bonding and rapport, that means you don't have comfortable, you know, and it's not a comfortable environment. When people aren't comfortable with you, they don't trust you with their information, so they they hold it closer to the vest, right? Yep. And our process is about gathering information versus giving information. Like traditional salespeople, someone asks them a question, they're like pouncing, right? They, they want to spill that candy yeah, on like, you, right? Here you yeah. go, here you go. And in our world, we're gathering a ton of information before we even start talking about us, our stuff, yeah. how we might be able to help. And it's so different what people are used to. So you don't get that bonding and rapport right and set a environment of comfort the rest of the process is is pretty tough. Yeah, because tr traditional salespeople have taught buyers how to lie, steal, lie, lie steal, lie, lie hide. hide. There you go. <laughs> they they lie. Hey, Jack, I'm interested in hearing what you're saying. Then they steal your time, your expertise, your energy. They lie again, and they say, "Hey, that was great. Thank you so much." They commit to nothing. Stroke, stroke, stroke. Yeah, great. and then yeah. they go into hide mode, and we turn into stalkers, right? Yes. Or we just don't even follow up. So. The, the system is equipped to disarm that dishonesty. Yeah. And prospects lie to protect themselves and because they were trained by the traditional salesperson, sure. I'll give you everything and I'll be an unpaid consultant and I'm okay with that, right? Not in our world. We yeah. don't want unpaid consultants. We want it to be equal business stature. So we have to establish the ground rules for that. I love it. Um, so I, I've been training in this system for probably, I think it's, it's got to be pushing 20 ish years. 15. I've been in 21 and a half years, and I feel like you were there almost the whole time. Yeah. So 15, 20 years, absolutely. 15, 20, 30, yeah. 70 years, something like that. <laughs> it feels like it. But 
again, the, the neat part is that we, we hear Kate who trains us and helps us. And next thing you know, I'm like, my gosh, I forgot I wasn't, I, I stopped doing that. Yep. Just like that. I heard it this morning. About. And yeah. he's their top salesperson in the HVAC world in that uh, Jersey, Philadelphia area. He crushes it. And he said, man, I used to do this. Every time I left the customer's house, I sent that digital recap, reminding them what we agreed to. And then we had strong commitments. And that was something I started getting away from. And it's my starting point to help them visualize 65% of people are visual. So you can verbally agree to things out of sight, out of mind. He's like, that was something I need to add back into my toolkit consistently. Consistently. Not just here and there. Yeah. That's not a process. Because here and there is like, I have some successes, but now, now I, if I don't do it all the time, I can't work on my, my skills or techniques in order to get better because I, I'm doing it every now and then. You're starting over. There's no, there's no ownership, right? We don't yeah. take it from knowing to owning. And mm-hmm. it's just like me, I, I'll be honest here, uh, dieting crush it and then mm, yeah i don't need to do that and then it's like such an uphill battle to get back to where you were and things like that so we all have things like that in our lives habits that we know are effective yeah but when we get busy they go out the window and that's what i heard this morning kate the summer picked up i was selling like crazy and i stopped doing those behaviors yeah, you're probably taking orders we can't right? yeah we can't stop doing the behaviors no matter what yeah right um so I had the opportunity to teach or share the Sandler sales system in a, in a large venue within the real estate world mm-hmm. on a big platform. Yeah. Um, you guys know who it is um, you know, I'm referring to. But anyway, I, I was able to ref, um, share this information. It was interesting that everybody was like, they're so focused on a technique or a script. Right there. That is the big thing. That is the difference maker between mm-hmm. a true sales professional and somebody that has an interest. Yeah. There's a commitment. And, and right there, and I'll pull this out of my back pocket. We, it's funny because I've been living this concept of I've got a million dollars in my pocket. I do not. Similar, you got some too? Like it's pretty close, this, right? Somebody looks pretty old. You have a statue of Liberty over here. Million dollars. Oh hey, God. you know why this is liberating? Oh, it is liberating. This is liberating. Yeah. And, and, and why it is is because When you believe you're financially independent and you do not need the business, your conversations get a lot easier. Mm -hmm. Salespeople are under such pressure, either themselves, if they have quotas, leadership coming down, looking at those numbers, that this pressure starts to apply and we get desperate. Mm -hmm. See, when you're financially independent, you don't need to have the business, but you'd love to have it, if it makes sense for both parties. So that's what I go in. I want to learn about people. What's your situation? What are you hoping to avoid, accomplish, alleviate? How might I be able to help you? Let's let's talk about that. And at the end of the day, if it's not a mutual fit, I don't try to force it because there's more people out there and I'm okay. This was hard for me at um, 20, 21 years old, two two kids by 23, a mortgage at 19. This was hard. Yeah. Had to do a lot of faking it till I made it. <laughs> Fake it till you make it. So um, it's just... There's so much more than tactics and technique. You don't get this right. You don't get rid of that head trash we yeah. talk about. You yeah. love head trash, right? Talking about head trash. You don't love head trash. You I like talking it. about head yeah. trash removal. But we all have it, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And if you don't get rid of that, yeah. you're not going to be able to use some of the tactics that we talk about, how to ask the tough questions. You're not going to behave consistently because you're not feeling well up here. Right. And when you're not feeling well up here, you just stop doing sometimes what works or stop doing anything consistently and behaviors re, or behavior or winners, behaviors, we, winners behave regardless of how they feel. Yeah. You behave yourself into a good great attitude, attitude. Or, great, or great attitude, yep. right? Good yep. student. <laughs> student. Yes. Yeah, um, student. So I think there's something that's like really deep before you even get into understanding the techniques or the system. Yeah. And it's really having that, like, it's the IR theory. Yes. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I'll talk about that. That's kind of where this million dollars in my pocket, you know, you have to have that confidence and you have to own it before we even, we have a 10 week sales course. And in that course, the first two weeks are around head trash and this IR theory that you alluded to. Mm -hmm. 
you have to understand that on our role side as a human being. So that's the IR. IR. Identity is who you are intrinsically as a human being. We all came into the world as tens, as winners, right? Yeah. And And whether you believe in God or not, somebody made you. And guess what? You were born in this world as a 10 out of a 10, right? Absolutely. Everybody came into this world. I don't have more value as a human being than you and vice versa. And a lot of people have t- tough time with that. Yeah. And some of the people that devalue them, their identity more than anyone else is themselves. Because you've got the identity side, so IR theory, the identity side, then you have the role side of life. Yes. The role side of life is where we screw it up. Yeah. And all those role failures throughout life, because some people have more than others, everybody has them. What, what's a, what's a, a role? A role is, as a salesperson, you get yes, you're a winner. You get no's, you're a loser. We love no's. Get them quickly and keep on moving so you can get to more yeses. It might not be a well-qualified no. Yeah. Or maybe I screwed it up. I didn't follow the system. Yeah. And I don't let that chip away at my identity. I still keep on performing and behaving in that role. That's where that winners behave differently and regardless of how they're feeling. Other roles, I'm a mother. I've been a mother since a very young age yeah. and I've screwed that up numerous times. Other times I'm crushing it, like I'm mother of the year. And you know, that's up and down. Am I a good mom? Am I a bad mom? We're constantly questioning, are we good enough? Yeah, a wife, a friend, a a, a daughter. Siblings, everything, right? Um, I was a basketball coach. How I led those kids was I wanted to make sure I never chipped away at their self-worth, because that's what your identity is, the value you place on yourself. And so many coaches out there, not just sales coaches, but athletic musician coaches they try to tear people down what's wrong with you you should do better and that doesn't help people grow Mm. how can we do better how can we improve versus you're an idiot (laughs) and and too many people hear that message throughout life so we have to do a lot of repairing the repairing of the eye which gets ingrained based like we call it that head trash starts from the time you're born it could be mom and dad telling you that you're worthless it could be somebody telling you that you that you stink at whatever you're doing absolutely and then it starts Because you don't know the difference between your identity and Mm -mm. your roles. Nope. And you you don't know how to separate those two. So we take everything on, you know, our identity side and we let that trickle into our roles. So mediocrity happens. People fall into comfort zones. If I try that, I might fail. So I better not even try. Or, hey, I'm comfortable here. I'm doing okay. I might not be up here, but at least I'm not that person. We do so much comparison to the, other people to make ourselves yeah. feel good, that at leasterhood and yeah. there's comfort zones. And that is where when we do this exercise, because there's a whole exercise that you're aware of. When we do that, I've done it with, and dad, with thousands of people now. And when I say, how many people placed yourself on a scale of one to 10? One, worthless without performing in my roles. 10, I'm a winner no matter what. We have very few people that have ever chosen 10 out of 1,000 people. Very few. And I I didn't, by the way. Most people don't. Some of the highest performers I know give themselves a two because the pressure of being perfect. And then when I ask people who fell in that four to seven category, 75, 80, 90% of the hands go up. I think I was one of them. I I spoke about this at Kutztown University uh, quite a few years ago. It was 100 students who were graduating from sports management program. And we did the IR theory, 100 kids. I said, how many of you chose a 10? Not one hand rose, natural. They're in college, pressure, parents, grades. I said, who went in the four to seven category? Every hand went up. Mm. That's at leasterhood. And then when they hear it, I don't wanna be an at leaster. I'm looking at them, you just, you're you're graduating college. Like this is the last days you are a success. That is so hard for most people to do that. I didn't even make it to orientation and back because life took a different path. So I'm telling people, you made it through college. You are a winner. That is not easy. And they're like, yeah, I I am a winner. So it it naturally starts to lift the way they think about themselves. But really that identity had zero to do with them graduating from college, right? No, it was the hard work that they put into it, regardless of, oh my gosh, can I do this? They still talk themselves into doing it even the days they wanted to give up, right? But it was and a, that's in but, sales too. But it was still a role. Absolutely. Right? It's your roles and roles, you're gonna fluctuate. You're gonna fluctuate between one and 10 days. You heard me say mother of the year, not so great. Yeah. Some days I had one day, some days I had a 10 day. Less, less 10 days, right? <laughs> and, but on that role side, as human doings, we're never gonna be perfect. We're gonna screw up, we're, we're human, right? That identity, you came into the world as a 10, you're gonna leave the world as a 10 as a human being who deserves the same amount of respect and self-love yeah. that you, everybody that we, we, we work with. And that's hard for people to grasp. Once they do, I've watched people take off 
that's why dad went into the business all those years ago. He knew that would change lives and it does. It does. It's, it's when you start to have that self value, um, huge changes take place in your life. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and I'm a testament to that because dad, he went into this business, I think I was in fifth, sixth grade. And he sat us all down, my siblings at the table. He did the IR theory. So I had heard it throughout the years. I went into the business around 22, 23. And I had a lot of crap <laughs> that you're, you're a little bit aware of. And from about 18 to 27, my life was rough. I had a lot of um, issues behind the scenes with loved ones. And um, I, I remember sitting in the back of the room at 27 years old. And I was questioning myself over and over like, oh, I can't call on this person. I can't do that. What? Oh, I have all this mess going on and a lot of it was not caused by me, but I was dealing with these things and adversity and I let it chip away at that I-ness, even though I knew better for all those years, since 11, that was 16 years I knew better. Yeah. One day, Jack, when it went off, the light bulb said, you're the only person that can place that 10 value on yourself, regardless of all the crap going on around you. You're goal driven. You know what you're doing. You can crush this. I started calling on CEOs, vice presidents, like, hey, would you be open to inviting me in? I never would have done that before that click, that IR theory. Mm. I had to hear it a lot. And now I'm helping people not take 16 years to have to get that. Yeah, you, you shrink that time for them. Absolutely, because I'm, I'm you, open up yeah. and real about what I went through and I'm understanding. I've watched young, a young lady that I've worked with uh, since she was an intern out of college. She is bought her own home at 25 with um, paid off her student loans. She went from low, low producing, about to let her go. And I said, give me one quarter with this young lady. She's so smart. Yeah. She loves process, those techniques that you were talking about. Yeah. But if we don't get this right, she will fail. The minute this switched in her, she took out or took off, she's blowing out her, her results, crushing it and growing and growing, promotions, raises, because that IR theory is what changed it. She said it was my attitude. Mm -hmm. I checked out. I checked out. Yeah. I wouldn't do the behaviors because I didn't think I could. I didn't think I could ask those tough questions. I thought nothing's going to get better. The no's were crushing her. And the minute she changed that mindset, that attitude, her outlook on things, her life improved dramatically. And we hear those over and over. Happened to me as well. So Yeah. So um, like hearing the no's yeah. and, and, and really letting people know it's okay. Yeah. To say no. In our world. How often does that happen in sales? Oh, oh press real hard. Third copy's yours. No. I got a yes from her. Mm -hmm. Now I'm going to deal with BS on the backside and the deal's probably going to blow up. Mm -hmm. That's why real estate, 30 to 40% of deals are falling out of escrow. Yeah. Because of excited salespeople. Happy ears. There we call go. them happy ears. <laughs> um, I, that's one of the things that I'm teaching people all the time. You don't have a closed sale, a deal, until we always say the check clears and like, be looking over your shoulder to make sure when on the way to the bank, but yeah. sign contract of that, right? Um, handshakes are not a thing of this world anymore. And so the happy ears, that's what gets most salespeople in trouble. They hear, I have a problem, Jack. And they're like, I got a solution. And they pounce. Yeah. And in our world, we're taking talking slow down to speed up, qualify what they're really saying and figure out, is this a fit or not? And if we do well qualified, um, have conversations to figure out what is and what isn't a fit, yeah. we can take those no's more easily because maybe they didn't have the budget. Maybe they didn't have the time to invest. Maybe there was decision makers who weren't on board. Maybe they didn't have enough reason, compelling reasons to do business together. Yeah. Maybe I blew it. Maybe I didn't build that trust and they didn't feel comfortable with me. There's so many reasons why it's a no. We wanna find that out quickly without wasting time without giving our stuff away. Yeah. And at the end of the day, if you followed the system, a no is awesome because you're saving time and moving on. Some will, some won't. Someone's waiting. So, or so what? Someone's, Someone's waiting. waiting next. I always yeah. invert those. So <laughs> what? Someone's waiting next. Go find the next yes. Yeah. If you don't have that eye confidence, that eye tenderness, it's really hard to go into the next call because you're assuming this will be another one. This is yeah. gonna be another no. And then another thing that affects the eye is giving too much credibility to others that are really not main characters in your life. And sometimes even main characters that have a lot of head trash because maybe they were raised in an effed up type of way. Absolutely. And then they, they convey that to you because you know you were told, get a job, 
go work for the, you know, go get just whatever it is. Yeah. You hear that chirping. Yeah. You know, yeah. That mom noise. And dad or, you know, Friends. Anything. The people that are supposed to support you and love you, not everybody grew up with that. Right. I, I grew up in a very nurturing background. You can do anything as, as long as you try, but that's not normal for a lot of people. And so they're fighting that of you're going to fail. Why are you even trying? You shouldn't be doing it. My father was raised in, in a very different way, right? So um, he had to overcome those things and just block out the noise. I've had people in my life that, you know, when things were really bad, they were right there. As soon as things started going good, those relationships changed. And that hurt my heart because I didn't change, you know. It was just sometimes we got to block out the noise because other people are waiting for you to fail they're, they're happy for your failure absolutely because it keeps them at, they, they don't have to grow and they can stay at that same level and not have to worry about the separation it's they uncomfortable want to for them it's uncomfortable seeing successful absolutely. others there's absolutely. very few people that you will have a conversation with and you're you're excited about like a success you had yeah there's so few people that you can have a conversation with and they are truly excited for uh, you. Just as excited. And that's where I found... You, you, see, you hear that? Yeah. Oh, that's that's great. Great. Yeah, <laughs> like it makes them more uncomfortable. That makes me feel pretty shitty about myself because right? my value isn't there. Yeah, and right? it's why I don't even talk about, like, I don't talk about my successes. I don't do that because, one, I don't want to ever make anybody feel like they're less of something. Right. And I just know that it people don't like that. My, my niece was a... Pfft, stellar athlete, gymnast, top of her class, every award you could think of. And throughout the years, she had quite a few haters because she was successful, yeah. but she was a wonderful, she is a wonderful, kind, caring, hardworking human being. And people don't, they don't care about yeah, that I mean, stuff. I remember your dad bringing her in and her having, standing up front, I think yeah. in the room. Yeah. <laughs> she was really young at She's, the time. I'm like, yeah. This little girl has like she's a, crazy. a ton of confidence. And, she, and then I saw what she became. Was, she's wow. in, she's about to finish up PA school. She went to college a year earlier. She won 1% um, of awards throughout academic and scholar athletes. Division, division one athlete. Division gymnast, gymnast athlete. Yeah. Um, she's uh, like, again, she's about to be a PA, a physician, a physician's assistant. She was going to be a surgeon, but wants to have a family and not work 80 hours a week. But she's one of those people that rated herself so low on that IR scale, I think two. Boy. Overachiever, has to be perfect, oh, yeah. don't want to let anybody down, never really had um, falls falls in gymnastics. She was, she was great at what she did. And those, when she started failing, that's when she started to grow. Mm. You've got to learn to win by failing. Mm. You're always winning. What are you going to learn from that, right? And so, that's why I alluded to some of the strongest people that I've met. When I hear their ratings, I'm thinking that does not match up at all with who you are. Yeah. It's because they were listening to the outside noise. They were so worried about what everybody else thought. I had to stop caring about that stuff <laughs> and just do me and be in competition with myself. So these are great foundations to get into the sailor sales process. Yeah, right? yeah. Right? So you had that bonding report, but you certainly understood the IR theory and mm -hmm. like your own value. And once you start having that, it allows you to actually get into the system, follow that process. Yeah. So after we're bonding and rapport, yeah. what's next? It's that the, the best way you can. See, bonding and rapport is a lot. I see you have your extended disc card there, like the four different behavioral styles, how to understand how you're wired and then adapt to others. That's a part of creating bonding and rapport. Active listening is the number one thing you can do. Um, there's body language, tone. But the one thing that gains the most respect and trust at the beginning of the process uh -huh. is upfront contracts. Yes. And the upfront contracts are what establishes the ground rules for how we will operate together. What our conversation will will sound sound like, right? And why we have to do that, if you remember earlier, we were talking about people are used to salespeople spewing, telling and selling versus listening and learning. Because they, they don't come in with an empathetic curiosity mindset mm -mm. they come in i just have the best yeah here's here's what we got for you and then i switched to the company b yeah and i got the best absolutely it's, even better, here. it's, even, better. it's even better here yeah and yeah, we right? don't go in with any of that we go in with an intention to learn everything we can about you your situation i always say the three a's but i don't i, I don't brand it because i'll get in trouble by triple a but avoid <laughs> alleviate accomplish you know if these if, if i'm in real estate and i'm going to meet with someone about selling their house I want to find out, have you done this before? What did you like? What didn't you like about it? What do you want to avoid this time around? Or, you know, how can I make you comfortable with this process? It's going to be important for me to learn those things yeah. so we know how to navigate this conversation. If you don't tell people you're coming in to learn about them, 
up front, the rest of the system falls apart and it gets a lot easier because they're not prepared to open up and ask, well, answer remember, they're, questions. They're, they're expecting that other the salesperson, the, yep, pitch. the like, pitch, I'm the best, yep. I'm this, this, and this, and it's not about them, nope. the client. It's no. all about me yeah. spewing my stuff <laughs> yeah you, all, right? all your features and benefits and the problem is if we don't ask questions first we don't know which one of those features and benefits align to their unique situation yeah. i've had a concept called the blank sheet of paper ever since i started in sales that blank sheet of paper if i'm meeting with you if i'm meeting with this person over here it i know nothing until i ask and even when they're telling me stuff i'm like take a step back let them talk come back to it hey you said something about five minutes ago. Tell me more about that. And they're like, oh, my God. They listened, they listened. right? It's, it's engaging people. They're not used to that. They're not used to having the floor. Most people, I think the most difficult thing to do in sales is. It is to be quiet. We have a 70-30 rule. 70% of the, speak, the, the talking should be coming from the prospect. 30% is just us aligning with what we've heard. And it's mostly asking questions, right? Absolutely. And, and it's by asking questions that we, we know how to navigate the rest of that conversation to quickly determine if it's going to be a fit or not. And if someone tells me I hated this about the, the real estate you know, process and buying and selling, and we're like, well, we do some of those similar things too. <laughs> we got to, yeah. I just want to be honest. That's, that's, that's typical in this world, yeah. right? Or... I'm glad you shared that. Let's come up with a plan to not go there again. So if we're not asking those questions, it doesn't power us with that ammunition to respond in the best way, right? Okay. And when you start talking about yourself and your stuff, it's a lot harder to zip it. You get into that. Now, even me, when I'm talking with you, I get excited and I get amped up and I'm like, okay, give Jack the floor. <laughs> you know, it's, it's all that telling, right? Yeah. It's, it's all the telling. Telling and selling versus listening and learning. There you go. Yeah. Seeking first to understand before being understood. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. So we're, we're getting a good understanding of what they're, we're coming with an empathetic, curious mind. Curious. And then there's systems, there's, there's questions and techniques, yeah. right? Yeah, to dig deeper. So if you set that stage, yeah. you set the stage for here's how the conversation will go. I'll first learn about you before you need to learn anything about us. We have to determine if and what might make sense or how we might work together. But I won't know that until I learn about you. So if you set the stage for that, now we can go into the actual qualification part of the process. Uncovering compelling reasons to do business, what we call pain. What do they want to avoid, alleviate, right? Um, then how are they going to make the investment? What are they willing and able? we got to ask questions around that. How are you planning to handle this? And then we got to talk about that decision process because that's where you do all this good stuff. And then people start saying, OK, let me think it over. We don't leave the house or the business with, OK, cool. All right. And believe that they'll get back to us because they usually don't. So that qualification process is what compelling issues do they have? Concerns. What do they need to accomplish? How are they going to invest to take care of it? Budget. And what are they, when are they going to make a decision? What's that process look like? Who's all involved in that cast of characters? Yes any roadblocks that could get in the way. And the criteria question, this is the ultimate contract question in our system that probably 90% of people won't ask. Just talked about it again this morning in training. You know, based on all the things that you shared today, Jack, if we're able to provide this solution that matches up with what you wanna accomplish, fits within that investment range that you're comfortable with, and we can get this thing rolling for you, would you be comfortable with us moving forward together? Most people do not ask that decision question. Mm. It's the ultimate contract question of how comfortable are they? Because yeah. it's, a, it's a testing question of, did I qualify well? Yeah. Did I make them comfortable this whole time? Do they feel comfortable enough with me that they don't need to talk to anybody else? They don't need to think it over. And when that question is left out, it makes that sales cycle a little bit longer. Yeah. Because there's no sense of urgency. It's interesting. Yeah. yeah. And we'd also, if they're like, eh, I don't know. All right, Jack, I must have missed the mark then. Yeah, we got to go back. And, Help me and, out. Yeah. Must have missed the mark. My goal is to make you 100% comfortable, not 90, not 70. So that qualification part of the system is what we find most people, they're just, their qualification, and I used to be guilty of this too, is, oh, you have a pulse check. Here's what we do, right? And that's what most salespeople do. That's how they qualify for interest. You're breathing. Yeah, they're breathing. <laughs> yeah. And then I'm giving you strokes and... Like, those are compliments, and, yeah. and that's all um, smoke and mirrors, yeah, right? Yeah, making me feel good. That was a great presentation, Kate. Oh, my Kate. gosh, you, oh, you were the best. Oh, my gosh, I know. Right? No, 
a well-qualified opportunity is an adult adult equal business stature conversation where we're engaging and we're having a dialogue not a monologue most salespeople, it's a monologue yeah and when you hear those strokes that's when you, the red flags go up right oh yeah those everybody thinks those positive prospects are the best i love the prospects who are mad they're irritated i'm sick i'm fed up with this i don't want to deal with those schmucks anymore all right thanks for being candid i love those people because you can be their problem solvers and they stay with you for life the positive people money's no object dad he used to joke about my aunt because she's like money's no object he's like yeah hon because there there really is no money there there is no object so we joke about those positive people that make our happy ears fly up yeah right and then a salesperson comes back and you go they, they told me but my presentation was great. So good. They, they complimented <laughs> me the entire time. It's in the bag. I got this. It's in the bag. And, and, I, and every time I've ever heard that from anybody that I've coached, guess what? Hmm. Zero. Right there. And a young man, he is no longer with the company that, that I work with. I'll never forget. He came, he came into the training room and he said, Kate, I got this one in the bag. I went home. I told my wife or my fiance about it. And it was a small sale, but he had just been starting out. It was like, any sale's wonderful. You're just starting out. And he had happy years. But when I asked him about, oh, so you got the signed contract. It's, in, it's a done deal. Well, not that yet. But they said they're leaning towards. Lean. Oh, you, okay. Guess what happened? The next day or a couple of days later, he came back. He was mad. He was angry. He was like, oh. they, they backed out. They never backed in. <laughs> they never bought in. Yeah. And he was embarrassed because he told his he told his fiance. He was embarrassed that he had to go back. He's like, I will never tell her that again unless I know it's in the bank. All right. Interesting. So we have pain budget decision. That's the qualification part. Yep. Right. So what what happens next? <laughs> if you've qualified well, you should you, you should close easily. Okay. So our our presentation step is now that I've gathered all this information, I want to align what we can do that fits within that yeah right and so our presentation is just taking everything that we gathered and putting it back like okay based on what you shared here's what we can do right and the best presentation at this point they'll never hear it or they'll never see it because it was theirs it was their information yeah. that you're tying back together and right. aligning your solutions so we've got the fulfillment step the presentation and after that it's like people hack this part off of the, the this, sales this cycle. And this is just as important as upfront contract. Absolutely. Th this next part is critical. The post-sell step. It's your back end upfront contract at the back end of, I'm going to go get this paperwork started before I go back here and get this rolling. You're 100% comfortable. We're good. Yeah. You're not going to wake up in the middle of the night, Jack, and be like, what have I just done? And people aren't used to that. People are like, okay, press hard. Third cup is yours and running out the door because they want to, I want to deal with any buyer's remorse up front. That buyer's remorse, that cognitive dissonance. Oh my gosh. Right now is the time to deal with it and letting them know. And dealing, like, here's the thing. We, we, get, we get this arsenal yeah. based on past experience. Yeah. Oh my gosh, in the real estate world. Well, I went home and, and my, my, my dad said, that <laughs> house is the worst. Like, you shouldn't buy that house. And you had that. I lived through that. I wanted this house at nine, 18, 19, 19 years old. And I'm like, I love this house. And my dad's like, Oh my gosh, if any of my energy customers, I have a lot of energy and oil customers. It, they, the oil furnace, right? Uh, he was like, you're not getting oil, Kate. Natural gas <laughs> is so much cheaper. So I wasn't allowed because he was co-signing and, and helping with that at that time. He talked me out of it. Yeah. And that real, that real estate agent wasn't aware that dad was part of that cast of characters. Yeah. So it is harder once you present to close because I didn't they didn't present to dad. Right? They yeah. presented to me, but that wasn't the full picture. But if they understand the decision process, yeah. my dad's going to help me make this decision. Yeah. So, Kate, let's suppose you go home and share with your dad that you signed this contract and it does have oil heat. Because mm -hmm. you did mention that oil might be an issue for mm -hmm. pumps. How are we dealing with that? Yeah. And that's what most salespeople will never say. They take Wimp Junction. Yeah. They won't say yeah. it. And I want to deal with that so they know how to go have that. We, we verbally rehearse how that will go. And that buyer's remorse people wake up in the middle of the night i know i do like oh gosh what have i just done i just booked that trip i just did that that's natural feeling but if someone has you know talked through it with you yeah. you wake up and you you acknowledge it but you're like i okay. told him i was good i can work through this yeah right so it, with, it's understanding how to work through that yeah. for yourself because again when you make that large purchase or what they perceive as a large purchase yeah. they do have that buyer's remorse potentially sure. even if it's a little bit and most of it is finding some type of a negative reason that has yeah. nothing to do with reality. Yeah, and a lot of times it's just nerves. Was it a good choice? Should have I done that? What could go wrong? And that's that's human nature. So we deal in the post-sell step with buyer's remorse up front. If there's other competitors, 
incumbents, you know, how to have those breakup conversations yeah. before we get too excited. How we'll work together, what next steps will be addressing. If you ever have concerns with me throughout this process, you give me a call. I want to hear it. Yeah. I want the chance to fix it. Work through that, right? We talk about how to communicate afterwards. I talk to people who can't even get hold of their own customers because they didn't ask. What do you prefer? Day, times a times a day, specific days, text, email, Snapchat. I mean, there's so many different ways now. And um to plant seeds for future business and introductions, to keep growing your network with the customer base you already have. Yeah, and that's that's the, it is the easiest way. Yeah. Somebody that trusts you, because you become a trusted advisor, yep. following the system and process. And again, the ones that don't want to work with you, it allows you to move on. Absolutely, we'll to find those people. We'll take, well, we'd love a yes, Yeah. but we'll certainly take a no, maybes or no's, and like, let's understand a well-qualified next step. Right there, because there is really four outcomes of a call. Yes, we love them. No, save time, learn a lesson if you screwed it up. Yep. Qualified, well-qualified future. Maybe not right now, but there are reasons that they are communicating that are valid, there are valid. I've had customers that became actual customers two years later. 100%. Dads yep. had ones five years later as they were growing their business, the timing was in place, the people were in place. And then the, the fourth thing is getting introductions. Even if you get a no from somebody, you can still ask, is there anybody else in your circle of influence I should be having this conversation with? Yep. And when I ask that question, nobody in the room raises their hand that they're doing that all the time, then, so, especially on cold calls. Yeah, think about the consistency of just doing that on every yeah. conversation. Yeah. Because remember, if you're getting all those no's, and that's fine. Yeah. Because every every no, if you do a calculation, it's tied to a dollar mm -hmm. of all the yeses that you it get. It leads you to a yes, right? Yeah. There's compound interest. And my sister-in-law, when she was back in the business, she was back to the cold call game, and she was like, oh, man, this is hard work. So she started asking for introductions. And she got a no from a gentleman, and she said, I gotta ask, this, this doesn't sound, it's not a good fit for you, I, I, I'm okay hearing that. Is there anybody else in your circle of influence I sh should be speaking with, having this type of conversation? He goes, actually, I know two people. She said, oh, okay, wasn't sure that would be the case. Yeah. One was another no. The other one, timing. They had just been talking about training. They showed up to our training room the next week, and I think three or five, I can't remember, three to five of their people came through. It turned into like, a $35,000 deal for her off of a no on a cold call because she did the behavior. So if you do it consistently, you show up consistently with the right attitudes, yeah. behaviors, yep. techniques, yep. it leads to growing a business just by asking for introductions. And the introduction is not. So in the, in the real estate world, we like this word called referral. Yeah. A referral was something different the way I define it. Okay. I like to talk about introductions. Yeah, good. That could be Kate. Yeah. So you mentioned that you want to introduce me to Shane. Mm -hmm. Would you be so kind to make a call? Yeah. And, and, and do an introduction or do a group text? I, I love it. I get one of my customers gives e introductions. They're amazing. And she puts e introduction and she says, Mary, um, I wanted to connect you with Kate. Uh, she is our amazing sales trainer. She talks about me so kindly like you do. And I, it, cha it changed my business. It, it tripled my results after the first year. And then it says, Kate, meet Mary. She is an up and coming business owner. Here's what she's challenged with. The two of you, I, I'm encouraging you to meet. Those are some of my easiest sales I ever make through those introductions. So by phone, you, I've sat around lunch tables with people that introduced us. LinkedIn, there's ways. So there's so many ways to get introductions versus a referral is just a name. Yeah, a referral, like, again, that's something that you get paid on based on potentially an introduction. Yeah, yeah. So we take it a little step further. So yeah, those, that's every sales call you go into, every prospect meeting. Yes, no, well-qualified future, what that means, or an introduction. Beautiful. Is there anything else to the process? Oh, there's a lot. I don't think we have time for that. <laughs> I, I know. Wait, that's what, why we have sales mastery, right? That's right. And that's one of the things that I wanted to talk about here. So like, mm. I have folks that watch this down in Mexico City, you know who you are. Um, mm. and some people up in Canada, across the U.S., and um, maybe over in Portugal, you know who you are. Uh, so anyway, we have these folks that are doing, like they're growing their business, yeah. and they may need sales training. Mm -hmm. How do they reach out to Kate? How do you reach out to Kate? Well, Kate Kohler, <laughs> um, Kate.Kohler at Sandler, S-A-N-D-L-E-R.com. My cell number, 717-870-1705. Ask Jack for contact information. I'm on LinkedIn, Katie Kohler. Um, I'll do an introduction. Many, many ways, yeah. So reach out to Jack, he'll, he'll, he'll connect us, so. Lots of possibilities yeah, to get, get connected. So Kate is one of the best in the business. And again, I was exposed to Sandler out in Philadelphia. Ed, your dad, Kate, 
some of the best sales training that we've ever experienced. I'm truly grateful for our relationship and all the things that you and your dad have done for us, yeah. have done for me, for yeah. my family. And we're, we're truly grateful for all the years and time <laughs> that you've invested into us because not many do. Yeah. We work with the 10% and you're the 10%. So again, th there is an investment involved in this. Yeah. It is, it's, it's not just your time, energy, money. Mm -mm. It, it, it's, it's everything. Like yeah. you, if you want to own this system, yeah. you got to, that's why we're still together. It. Right. You got to pour into it. Yeah. And, and you heard me earlier say, even the, the top salespeople in some of the organizations, they still slip up. Yeah. They still forget, they get busy. And that's why they continue to come back. Not because they're slow or they don't get it. They don't stop going to the health club. For their for their physical you know growth they, they they're constantly getting to the room whether it's a live or virtual room these days they're constantly coming back to continue and strengthen their skill set i love it so i'm super grateful that i got to have the opportunity to have kate kohler here on the lair podcast today kate thank you so much you're welcome jack thanks for having me thank you make your day great take care